this series of webinar will be the basis for the Eufogen community to define approaches for the management of the network of genetic conservation unit in case of biotic outbreaks. Eufogen, the European Forest Genetic Resource Program, is an international cooperation program promoting the conservation and the sustainable use of forest genetic resources in Europe. Eufogen is an implementation mechanism of Forest Europe, the pan-European high-level forest process that aims to develop common strategies on how to protect and sustainably manage European forests. Today, we have two guest speakers who, has, who have kindly agreed to share the knowledge and the recent uh, scientific findings on the pathology of ash at dieback and on the potential invasion of a border. Our first speaker, Michelle Clary, a forest pathologist working with native and alien invasive forest pathogens. Um, she is a senior lecturer of the Swedish University of Natural Science. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will share my presentation. Can you see it in presentation mode? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I just want to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me to give a talk on one of my favorite topics. It's a real privilege to be able to open this webinar series that is having focus on ash dieback and uh, a specific focus on this outbreak epidemic and what can be addressed from a genetic perspective. So I really look forward to seeing the next series of talks that will largely dive into that topic. Uh, I was asked to start off this webinar series with a talk about phytopathology of ash dieback and where we are at today in terms of this epidemic. So just to remind you all, we're talking about ash. In Europe, we um, have several different species of ash. The major ash species includes uh, European ash, also known as common ash, which is the most widely distributed species, as you can see on the map. It's uh, present in most all European countries and it extends east into continental Russia. Uh, Narrow-leafed ash or, or uh, flowering ash, manna ash, uh, they, they tend to have a rather large Mediterranean distribution in the south and the southeastern parts of Europe. And another ash species occurring in Europe is the North American green ash, Fraxinus pennsylvanica. And this has been introduced to the central and eastern parts of Europe going back to the 18th century, where it's been used for ornamental purposes, um, particularly its cold tolerant forms for greening in cities and towns, but it's also used uh, sometimes for timber production and in shelter belts in rural areas. And the unfortunate scenario that we have today looks a little bit like this, where you can see from this aerial photo an ash forest that's showing large scale decline and mortality. So the problem that we have in Europe today has primarily occurred because of the accidental human facilitated introduction of a fungus that's known as Hymenoscephus fraxinius to Europe. Uh, likely it came in on nursery stock of Asian Fraxinus species, perhaps Fraxinus manchurica, from somewhere in the east. And here you can see the approximate native range of Fraxinus manchurica in the east, within this dark gray zone there, extending from parts of China through Korea and up into the far east corner of Russia. And during the years of trying to figure out the origin of this disease, um, by studying isolates of the fungus collected from various locations across Europe and comparing them to samples obtained from sites located within the natural range, we see that the East Asian population of Hymenoscephus fraxinius is more genetically diverse compared to the European one. So this is a classic situation of an alien species that has been introduced where you have high genetic diversity in the original source population in East Asia, and maybe some few individuals that have been transferred to Europe. So you have this founder effect or genetic bottleneck and lower genetic diversity in Europe at the moment. We don't completely know how it came in, but 
Evidence from other studies suggests that there were two divergent haploid individuals that have founded the European population of Hymenoscaphus fraxineus. And we know based on some of our previous work that the fungus is non-pathogenic on Fraxinus manchurica in its native origin. So there it, it behaves more like an endophyte. It causes symptomless infections throughout the summer, but then later switches its lifestyle mode to be uh, degrading the leaves when they senesce and shed. And once they're on the forest floor, they continue to be degraded. So it contributes to the recycling of that material to the soil. So in Asia, it's a relatively harmless fungus that has a symbiotic relationship with its host. Uh, and the important thing here is that it's a, it's a fungus that likes to colonize ash leaves. And the reason why we have this disease in Europe is because there was a host shift. So it jumped onto the European ash species. And here you have a situation now where the fungus meets a naive host. So the interaction is not any more a sym symbiotic relationship. It starts to feed on, or I should say colonize, uh, living plants of ash. And no one could have predicted this to be a problem for European ash because the fungus is not known to be a pathogen on Fraxinus for the, mo for the most part within the native range of, uh, in East Asia. So because the fungus doesn't cause any noticeable disease on Fraxinus manchurica, it was probably very inconspicuous when it came in on perhaps uh, material through the plant trade, didn't have any symptoms. If it had some of those remnant rachises or the petioles, which is the primary habitat, now finding itself in a similar environment that favored its reproduction and spread, and also having found a similar host that was able to satisfy its niche requirements, this is what has allowed the fungus to sort of build up the population to become invasive. And this is what the fungus looks like. I'm sure that most of you have seen pictures like this. Uh, this is a heterothallic ascomycete fungus. It reproduces sexually and annually on the fallen leaf rachises in the leaf litter. This is the primary habitat where both infections occur and where it completes its life cycle. Uh, and these are the sexual fruiting bodies that are called apothecia that are produced on these rachises. They have They've fallen to the ground the previous year and have overwintered. Uh, and when they do that, they produce this sort of black uh, protective layer. Uh, so the right time to see these sorts of fruiting bodies in the field is usually between June and August. Uh, this particular picture that you see here is actually from an infection experiment that we did um, about 10 years ago now, uh, where we were trying to describe the early stages of infection on European ash. And uh, I was very surprised to uh, see that each one of those rachises can produce up to 200 individual apothecia. Uh, and from each of those, you have millions of spores that are produced. So you can just imagine that there's a really high infection potential with these airborne spores during several weeks in the summer. Uh, on the right, you can see what the fungus looks like when you grow it in culture. It produces these nice brown mycelia. And if you look under the microscope, you can see some uh, anatomical structures of, of the fungus that is are sort of diagnostic. Uh, in Europe, we have a very similar fungus called Hymenoscephus albidus. And this fungus basically does the same thing. It colonizes the leaves and the rachises once it falls to the ground. And to the naked eye, um, Albidus and Fraxinius are almost indiscernible, but you can distinguish them morphologically based on certain microscopic characteristics about their anatomy. I won't get into the details of those. Uh, but importantly, they're both specialists. They both have a role as decomposers of ash leaves in their native environment. And what we have seen in Europe is that Hymenoscaphus fraxinius uh, is a strong competitor and it has competitively displaced Hymenoscaphus albidus to assume its ecological niche. So in 
most areas where you used to find Hymenoscaphus albidus, you can't find it anymore. There has been a lot of people, researchers, uh, uh, different countries around Europe that have been working to understand the interaction of the fungus with the tree, what are the factors affecting pathogenicity of the fungus, and what is the resistance biology of the trees. And many studies over the years have looked into pathogenicity factors associated with the fungus by studying the secondary metabolites they produce. Uh, several steroid-like compounds have already been isolated from those studies of the secondary metabolome of Hymenoscaphus fraxinius, and some of those have been reported to exhibit selective uh, antifungal activity. And in particular, viridiol was found to have some phytotoxic activity, so it produced some brown necrotic lesions when it was applied to ash seedlings uh, in the laboratory. Uh, and it was suggested to be involved in its pathogenicity, but then it was later found that this same phytotoxic agent is also produced by its non-virulent sister species, Hymenoscaphus albidus, the native fungus that we have here in Europe. And in various tests with different concentrations of this compound and different isolates, it didn't really correlate very well to uh, the virulence of the fungus. The same with the volatile lactone, for example, of Hymenoscaphus fraxinius, that was actually identified to inhibit uh, germination of ash seedlings. Very similar to viridiol, this volatile metabolite could also be uh, detected in Hymenoscaphus albidus, the native fungus in Europe. Um, so it's a little bit inconclusive. It's maybe likely that there are other uh, as of yet un unidentified secondary metabolites that are more relevant for mediating the virulence of Hymenoscaphus vaccinius. And this is obviously an area where we need to have some further studies to understand their phytotoxic activity. So what happens when the trees are, interact with the fungus? Uh, the infection first makes its way into the tree when the spores of the fungus, uh, which are carried by air and they're wind dispersed, uh, can be several kilometers from the source, that they will land on the healthy leaves during the summer months. The spores will germinate and the fungus then starts to grow into the leaves, down into the rachis, and progressively into the twigs, branches, and the stem. And this progressive progression causes the tree to lose part of its crown and in some cases to collapse. And uh, already you see um, uh, by that top middle picture there, uh, at the end of the growing season, you can see symptoms on the leaves, these characteristic necrosis along the leaf veins and necrosis of the rachises. And as the fungus grows into the shoots, it develops these sort of dark brown orange diamond shaped lesions or cankers along the bark and the branches and on the stem. Uh, and then it starts to cause a more progressive dieback of the shoots, the twigs and the main stem. And this is resulting in crown dieback. Um, the fungus also gets into the tree at the base. Um, and uh, it does so through, uh, or it is thought to do so through lenticels in the bark. So those are uh, anatomical structures of the of the periderm that allow for gas exchange between the tissues. And studies have shown that uh, lesions are commonly developed around those uh, uh, anatomical features. So it probably serves as an infection court for the fungus. And the pictures on the far left um, is from a publication by Skusgard et al. Uh, and here you can see what those basal lesions look like. Um, on, the, on the far left is the early stage of necrosis with this sort of red-brown discoloration in the wood. And uh, further to the right, you uh, over time, you get more advanced collar rot and discoloration coming in. And where you see decay uh, on some of these pictures, it's usually associated with uh, not so much hemenoscaphus, uh, um, uh, but the more armillaria that will uh, subsequently enter the tree. And that can be what actually kills the tree. 
So under some cases, under some conditions of high humidity and high disease pressure, healthy trees can actually die suddenly, and this is due to the presence of root collar infections. Uh, and those root collar infections are not really connected to the leaves in any way. So even if you have a healthy crown, you can have heavy infection at the base. Um, but you can also have terrible looking crowns and no lesions at the base. Uh, so yeah, it can be a little bit confusing, but uh, the resulting damage on the tree is, it's not a continuous systemic effect following initial infection. It's rather a cumulative effect of multiple and annual infections on the trees. And in severe cases, this leads to death, but mm, it's, it's in older trees, especially it's a slower killer. Uh, it usually leads to other secondary agents like armillaria finishing the job. Just to remind everybody about sort of the evolution of this uh, epidemic, um, it started back in the, uh, it started to be recognized back in uh, 1992, um, where uh, there were observations coming out of Poland and Lithuania of ash stands that were really in a bad state of decline. And since then, it had spread to other regions in Europe. The causal agent was still quite unknown for several years. Uh, several groups were trying to uh, discover what that was. And even in the early 2000s, a cholera-like uh, fungus was isolated from lesions. But it wasn't until 2006 when the Polish researchers identified the asexual state as being cholerofraxinia. Uh, a few years later, they associated the sexual state uh, to that, and they mistakenly identified it as Hymeniscephus albidus. You remember that uh, native fungus that we have in Europe. Uh, but just within a year, the Swiss researchers uh, clarified that, in fact, it is a new fungus, which was called Hymeniscephus pseudoalbidus. And since 2014, uh, the nomenclature of this fungus has been revised. So it's now known as Hymeniscephus fraxinius. Um, I always find it very interesting when I lecture my students to show this picture here from Lithuania. And you can even see the date on it in the bottom right corner, 1997. And while the quality of the image is not great, you can see that the forests there are really in an advanced stages of decline. And this suggests to me that actually the problem was going on for many, many more years than before early, much earlier than 1992. And in the years that followed, obviously the fungus had spread to other parts of Europe. Today, the pathogen covers most of the natural range of ash in Europe. And here on this map, you can see the distribution range of European fraxinous species in green. And the hashed, uh, the hashed regions indicate where the secondary range of the ash dieback pathogen is in Europe. Uh, it also shows on this map uh, with the dots, the secondary range of emerald ash borer, but since this map is a few years outdated, we know that this is even further expanded in the west and southwest direction, and RIMVIS will show that more precisely in the next talk. So many of the forests in Europe today are looking quite sad, for lack of a better word. In some areas, the mortality of the mature ash is quite heavy, with only barely few surviving in a, in a stand, like what you see on this picture here. Most of the trees have died. Several of them are on their way to die. And the effects of the disease uh, has also had a continuous knockdown effect on regeneration. It really reminds me uh, it appears quite similar to what has happened with chestnut blight in eastern North America on American chestnut, where it's basically reduced to a shrubby form. And uh, ash is one of those species that's notorious for sprouting because of the uh, epicormic buds that lie dormant just beneath the bark surface. So if it kills the shoots, it will re-sprout again, and it just, uh, the fungus continues to knock it down year after year. So what happens when the disease arrives to an ash forest or an ash plantation? How do the trees die? 
or I should say, how fast do they die? Uh, a more recent publication that has uh, looked at different studies where people monitored the status of ASH throughout the years after the disease uh, was identified there and how many trees have died on those sites. If you put all of those studies together um, from across Europe, you get a graph um, that looks like this one here on the right that shows that in the first two decades, the mortality reaches around 60%, and then it starts to sort of stabilize from there. So yeah, the, the, the short answer is that you will get a lot of mortality uh, in the first years after it arrives to a new place, but then se several trees will still be around. And what happens to those trees, those ones that don't die? Uh, if we look into Lithuania, for example, one of the countries with the longest dieback history, um, there the Forest Service established several permanent mon monitoring plots that um, uh, were established after that initial wave of mortality to try to understand how the remaining ash trees will fare over the years. And uh, you can see that um, here they have the scale that's rated uh, as far as increasing damage severity, where you have the healthy trees are in the light, bright green, uh, and it's becoming more and more damaged and killed trees are indicated in gray. So uh, what we can learn from this is that over the years, those, those annual multiple infections on the trees, they inflict a lot of damage. Many of the trees are continuously weakened to the point where they become much more susceptible to other damaging agents like armillaria. And you can see here that the uh, only a small fraction of the trees um, remains, uh, of the healthy trees, I should say. So it's been reduced to something like 1% in 2018. And beyond 2018, they discontinued the monitoring of those plots. Uh, another example on the status of ash trees from another country in Norway, uh, two different sites. Um, one was more of an Atlantic region, the other more continental. And here, of course, in Norway, it arrived much later than in Lithuania. But again, still showing sort of a, a gradual trend of deterioration of the health class over time. And why there may be more dead trees on some sites than other sites? Um, well, this that sort of impact of the disease depends a lot on climate conditions of the sites. And most likely, humid conditions that might result in higher damage of ash dieback. So this sort of comes back to uh, this sort of um, principal concept in plant pathology, which is the disease triangle, where it emphasizes that all three elements of host, pathogen, and environment are in play in determining the amount of disease that can result. So uh, some fluctuations in disease severity can be observed from year to year. And I'm sure that many of you have also noticed this uh, during the time that you've been monitoring ash. And that may be in part due to the weather conditions that occurred in the previous season. Because what you see as a result of dieback in the shoots and branches in one year at the beginning of the season is really a reflection of the infection conditions from the previous year. Um, in most countries, there are different efforts in place for monitoring the extent to which European populations of Fraxinus species have been declining. And uh, I, I became very interested in this paper that was just published uh, in 2022 by George et al. And they attempted to map mortality rates over the last three decades using data from ICP forests, which is the uh, stands for the International a cooperative program and it compiles information about the condition of forests uh, based on thousands of observation plots that are established on a grid throughout Europe. Uh, and they looked at more than 400 plots across 27 countries where uh, there was either European ash or narrow leafed ash and they were able to reconstruct some of those mortality rates in the different countries. And something very interesting is that they showed where those mortality hotspots are. 
And there you can see that on the map on the right side, as indicated by the size of the different circles on the maps, um, as being more of a hot spot than other areas. So yeah, this it also sort of suggests that maybe some of these areas should be given priority in the future for rescue and conservation programs. And without those sorts of efforts, uh, it can cause sort of a non-reversible loss of genetic diversity. And this is something really important to consider, especially if we think about having an improved population for restoring disease sites, um, a population that is more resistant to the ash dieback fungus, but also the genetic diversity of that population being able to withstand future threats like that which Rimbus is going to talk about next. So we can just also remind ourselves why it's important to save ash. So in Europe, ash is recognized as the keystone species, um, and these are species that have critical importance um, uh, for a lot of different biodiversity. In, in Sweden, uh, ash is now a red listed species, and it has been since 2010. And since 2015, its status has sort of worsened. Um, and there are a lot of organisms that are highly and sometimes even obligately associated to ash. So we really uh, risk to lose a lot of other species populations because of losing ash as a tree species. And of course, yeah, we cannot forget the whole economic side of things for ash. It has immense value with a whole diversity of manufactured wood products that you can get out of it, flooring, tools, hurley sticks in Ireland, uh, lots of different uh, products uh, that we value today. Um, I think in the interest of time, I will skip through this. This is just to emphasize that in some of these really deteriorated ash stands, we have our malaria that is taking down the trees. So it's quite hazardous to walk through. And uh, I also didn't even realize that I was parked underneath a, a leaning tree. Um, so I was lucky that I got out of there. But in, if you look at all these down ash trees, you can see that most of the major lateral roots are uh, broken off and degraded and you can find our malaria on those. And if you go into forest today, uh, like in Sweden, you might see something like this. Perhaps it doesn't look too bad. Actually, some stands look fairly okay, but uh, others clearly not. The mature stands are much more variable, uh, so you probably lose a bit of diameter growth over time. But then you can find these really heavily infested trees, barely surviving, where most of the primary crown is gone. Uh, and you have a lot of epicormic shoot abundance there. Uh, but even amongst this devastation, we can find uh, some few trees that actually survive. This is a younger plantation in southern Sweden. And even here, you can find really good survivors. So there is a small proportion, all of you know this, of the population that shows a high level of tolerance to the disease. And this uh, tolerance seems to be under strong genetic control. Um, so this gives yeah, very good options for us to go forward with breeding for resistance. And of course, this is the interest of most of you who are attending this webinar. And it's these types of trees in our forests, in our landscape, that we want to select to find those individuals in a population of ash that's really heavily infected, that's really exposed to heavy infection pressure that are seemingly more tolerant of the disease. Uh, I will not go deeper into this because the speakers in the next talks of this webinar will focus exactly on that, on the genetics and understanding disease tolerance and those breeding efforts that are currently underway. And yeah, I can just say that within this, within the scope of uh, Eufragen and other international networks, including uh, the previous cost action, FraxBAC, this has really provided very good platforms for wider collaboration to happen in, uh, yeah, I think all of our common quest to save ash for the future. 
So I will leave it at there. Just some acknowledgements to our large funders of the ASH research in Sweden. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about what Sweden is doing as far as working towards developing more resistant population, you can read about it here at our citizen science platform called Rada Asken, which is Save the Ash in English. And this was set up some years ago. It's been engaging the public in our research um, and in the reporting of the location of healthy ash trees. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was really very uh, interesting and um, it will be an important reference for us in, in the future work. And as I mentioned, this will be made available. So uh, I'm sure that um, for, it will be a basis for um, an overview uh, on your research and on the, on the disease itself for um, some time from now on. Uh, I would like to open the floor now for questions. So please, I ask um, the, the, the people attending, we have about 200 participants online. Um, if you can kindly raise your hands and then we will try to give the floor to um, as many of, um, as possible of you. And then, and then once um, um, I, will, I will say that we can uh, devote something like the 10 minutes to this question and answers, and then there will, can be also interactions later on and I'm sure you will be also available for individual interaction if needed. Uh, I just want to mention that if I'm not mistaken, Jan Peter Georg, the, the leading author of the, the paper that you mentioned, he should also be online from this from Luke. Um, so I see that okay, no, in this moment I don't see any any hands up. Um, I can break the ice. I found it really interesting the fact that you mentioned that um, in the in the origin um, distribution is not um, is not a disease that is bringing to the dead the host uh, a tree. This means that it's impossible to have a map of all the possible um, fungi that we have around the world and how they can combine with with other tree species. So I think that we should be having a sort of vanilla warning system. So when something happens, uh, to know what to do before it's too late. I don't know if you have devoted some thinking of how this early warning system on how we could be reacting or what kind of um, indication we should have in order to know that we have to react. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is absolutely a, a huge concern and, and many people have been thinking about it and how can we learn from the lessons of the past? Because now um, ash dieback, I would say, is probably going to go down in the history books in forest pathology as one of those classic examples, very similar to chestnut blight, where it was introduced uh, on an Asian species. And mm, one thing that is actually uh, gaining a lot of attention uh, is the use of sentinel trees as an early warning system against potentially damaging threats that, uh, that may come to different countries. So the sentinel, the whole sentinel concept is like the canary in the coal mine, you know, putting the canaries down there and they are, uh, if they're dying, it's an early indicator of carbon monoxide poisoning. Uh, there are uh, a lot of new initiatives underway uh, across the globe where people are planting um, uh, species from North America in Asia and Europe. And again, also reciprocal to try to understand, are there any uh, threats that we should be concerned about in these situations? Of course, uh, there, are, there are problems in itself with establishing these types of trials because you're bringing in material to a location. So there's a bit of a risk, but the, the sentinel concept I think is actually quite valid and it can be, there's a lot of potential for further development of that as an early warning tool. Thank you very much. So we have um, a person asking the floor for a, for a question, and then we have a few questions in the chat. So I will ask first uh, Emma Goldberg, if you can kindly introduce yourself, uh, well, unmute, introduce yourself, and then ask your question. Hi, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I'm based in the UK, uh, and I'm an ecologist working for Natural England. Um, I, I'm very interested in natural regeneration and I've been reading papers from Eastern Europe, from Poland, 
by Turksansky et al. two years ago, uh, looking for niches where natural regeneration might be happening in the face of the disease. And I wondered, you were talking about monitoring of the disease earlier. I wondered if you have seen much natural regeneration. You mentioned that it was shrubbier, but I just wondered how much you're seeing surviving. Uh, actually, that's one aspect that we haven't got a good handle on here in Sweden yet. Um, but there's lots of potentials. Now we actually submitted a proposal to look exactly at that aspect of uh, natural regeneration, especially connected to our resistant inventory database that we have now, where we have more than a thousand trees that have been selected across the country. Uh, it would be very interesting to go back into those areas and see how does it fare with the natural region. Um, just remembering all the surveys that I have been doing myself over the years, it's quite variable. In, on some sites, you can have really uh, quite dense natural region, and some of them actually look quite good. In other areas, it's quite a lot of disease. Um, so I have also seen some of those uh, more recent papers that have come out about it, but uh, yeah, we haven't investigated that here ourselves yet. Okay. Thank you very much. Then there is a question in the chat uh, asking if there has been any record on spores surviving in the soil and then infecting to roots or underground parts. Um, there are, uh, I don't know about uh, any specifics about spore survival in the soil, but the the um, the belief is that um, you have quite a lot of heavy infection pressure uh, in the forest floor uh, where you have all the fruiting that's happening and it, those spores could migrate down into sort of the soil and and uh, infect through the bark of the roots. So this seems to have been demonstrated already in a couple of studies. And uh, if you want, I can, in the chat later on, put some of those citations there of those studies that have- That would be very helpful. That. Thank you very much. Then we have uh, Joe Clark um, asking the floor, and then I will read another question, and then I think we will need to, uh, to move on. Um, please, Hi, Joe. Joe. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for your great talk. Um, I was very interested in your resistant trees and you just said you've got over a thousand selected mm. are, are you are you assessing those annually are they are they in the wider environment or have you secured them somehow and are those thousand trees still looking really really good or are they beginning to die back a bit because this is what we're doing in the UK and we have selected but some of our selections have been made early and they're still dying back so I'm just mm. curious how how good is that population and what are you doing with it so some of the early selections that we've started uh, during 2014, 2015, we uh, revisit them four years later and see if they are still uh, viable to have in our inventory database. And in some cases, uh, we have actually dropped some of those trees because their health status has deteriorated. Uh, at the same time, we've also been adding um, new selections and um, it's I think it's really important to try to go back and sort of get a, a more clear picture of the of the status of those trees not just in a one-time one-off assessment but actually how they are doing over the years because as you can see from those uh, studies in in Lithuania and Norway uh, those that are really vital during one year, over the t over time, they will deteriorate. So this is something that we we have to be on top of, and uh, we have actually only been able to test uh, about ten percent of what we have selected in the field. And those trees that are selected and marked in the field, um, uh, yeah, they will remain there until we have enough money to test everything. But due to our fluctuating funding situation, this is mainly the reason why we haven't been able to do more wider uh, screening tests of everything that we have selected. Thank you very much. And the last questions I will ask, I would love to ask you to, to just reply briefly because we are a little bit tight in time, comes from Francois Lefebvre that is asking if in addition to the host shift, 
is there any evidence of the fun of the fungus itself evolving in the in the host after um, after the initial introduction uh, that is a really good question <laughs> i have to say i don't have a good answer to that um yeah i i don't know somebody okay. should research that yeah well, this is already a, a reply itself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle, again for uh, for your time and for your contribution. Thank you. Uh, now we move to our second speaker, Rimsi mm, Vasiatis. Mm, I hope I pronounce it mm, properly this time. Uh, a researcher and a field mycologist in the Swedish University of Natural Science as well. He's an expert on um, forest health and, and protection mycology, ecology, and civiculture. He will give a presentation on an emerging threat uh, for ashes. As Michelle anticipated before, uh, very often uh, there is something else that will kill the tree that once has been infected uh, by a pathogen. So he will give a presentation on the potential invasion of um, emerald ash border. Bambis, uh, please, the floor is yours. OK, can you hear me? Very well, thank you. And we okay. can see the presentation. Good day, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. So I will start talking about Emerald Isle Borer's journey in Europe, in continental Europe. So basically, this presentation is based on three publications with my Russian team and one publication with my Ukrainian team. So it's very exotic combination, kind of uh, dynamite presentation. I will come back to that. So it's based on four recent publications, and all are open access. So it will be open, it will be available to everybody if you want to go in more details. So then we will start with our yellow, no, green emerald friend. This is the adult beetle, this is the larva, and this is what it does into the tree. And then I'm referring to these publications in the order so you can track easily these uh, illustrations. So the same story, generally like with Hymenocephus, the in Russia, the natural range of emerald ash borer is the Far East, but it also goes all uh, into the North China, Manchuria also. And it's not noticeable at all. Before it invaded the United States in 2000, or in the last decade of 2000s, it was only publication and only in Chinese on that insect. So they, they they had in the United States they had really problem to track as to who they have uh, dealing with, and then it came to Moscow. And um, what the Russians think uh, it was uh, by long distance transportation of wood or maybe saplings, most likely from China. And then in Moscow it killed most of the ash trees and started to spread in all direction forming spatially an interrupted population, as you can see here. But you can also notice small dot here, so I will come back to that later. So in Northwest, it was closing to the boundaries of St. Petersburg province, and it was continuously detected along the highway from Moscow to St. Petersburg, up to 170 kilometers. OK, sorry, here. It was looking like that all along the way up to that point. So this is the city of Tver. It's 170 kilometers from Moscow. And then the picture was from Tver. Then my Russian friends, they checked all this way further and they didn't notice anything. No emerald ash borer. So it was looking like it's a northwestern limit of the spread. But the same year, it was found in St. Petersburg. Like more than 500 kilometers north. And these white dots, they are present, they made an inventory in the city. It's a large city. And these white dots represent all the areas checked, and the red dots represent the areas where the emerald ash borer was found. So this suggests this distance, just sudden jump, suggests the invasion by hitchhiking of cars or trucks or railway. And actually, from North America, there is uh, evidence that the living adults can be transported by cars hidden in the car body or wipers. And for typical for St. Petersburg is the fines are, as you can see, this is an important highway, 
And this is the Petrodvorets. I don't know if you had probably many of you know the name. This is the park of the Russian Tsars. And then in the other side of the city, also close to the or to the to the river, and there can be some transportation over there. So it all indicates possibility for hitchhiking. And the the question is like whether it were two events or whether it was one event and then it was taken to the other side of the city. Nobody knows how it was. So typical picture in St. Petersburg. So you got some small squares or parks or alleys and then you got it like that. So this is funny picture by Mark Volkovich. So he managed to find emerging the adult from the from the tree. Just it's published as you see. So this is St. Petersburg story. And then we can come to conclusion about St. Petersburg. That invasion from St. Petersburg to northern EU is possible. Of course, it's so close geographically. It's close to the border, both to Estonia and to Finland. And they have had some transport corridors there. As you can see here, the St. Petersburg is there and like a, and then by the way, all the way to Estonia. And then on the other side, by the way, to Finland. And as I was told, there's a quite a lot of ash trees along the coast and also in Estonia and also here. So another possibility is if it will get, but the climate is quite hard. I was living there for three years, so I know. But so, and then we can go to the another direction, to southwestern direction. And uh, there we see continuous population. So what can it happen? It can happen either by flying from tree to tree. As to the references, again, from the North America, it's a good flyer. The females normally fly three kilometers per day. Some may, can make 10 or 20 kilometers per day. All these references are in these papers, so if you will be interested, you can easily track them. So basically, then we have the large continuous population down from Moscow down to Ukraine. And then in 2019, in, invaded eastern Ukraine and then was spreading further westwards. Here again to the same, we can see con large continuous population and then St. Petersburg is here like a small pocket. Right. The picture close by Yuri Baranchikov, close to the Ukrainian border. This is uh, actually still uh, Russia. So let's look at the situation in Ukraine 2019-2021. So this is the part of Ukraine that the study is represented. Probably, if you're interested in news or politics, the names like Kharkiv, Severodonetsk, Kupansk, Izum is, have been here before, right? So these studies have been done in 2019. My Ukrainian friends found uh, invasion in this particular area. In 2020, it expanded further west. And in 2021, even further west. If now it will be dynamite part of the publication because if you will look at the situation in 2022 at the very same area, you will see that one type of invasion from Russia is being pushed away. So this is Kharkiv and this is a Severodonetsk. So this is exactly one year after when we collected the plant material and insects for our further studies. So what conclusions could be drawn for Ukraine? Yes, from this direction, it has really large potential to the spreading further to Poland, Slovakia or Hungary or Romania. And then ash in Ukraine is actually very common in field protection belts along roads and the railways. And a part of uh, Fraxinus Excelsior is very, very popular is Fraxinus Pennsylvania, which is extremely susceptible for uh, emerald ash borer. And then to, uh, to ongoing war, they are pushing other invader, so nobody will care, take care about emerald ash borer, and emerald ash borer doesn't care about the war. So basically, it's really large potential for further expansion towards the EU. And the climate is very, very good, it's warm. Another thing should be noted that in Ukraine, ash is also threatened by the ash dieback. And the infestation by Coming infestation by emerald dash borer combined with ash dieback can be more lethal than either of them alone. 
And then the, in our recent Ukrainian study, we got really indication that ash that shows more resistant to ADB could be more prone to emerald ash borer and vice versa. And if you need more details, this is the reference and this is on the second slide. You can easily track it afterwards. So, and then we managed the spikes just before the war, the, during the years before the war, to manage to get material from St. Petersburg and Ukraine. And now we are working with populations of emerald that war, both in the north and in the south, and we got a lot of adult beetles and larvae. And then we got a unique opportunity to, we used to have in the previous years, to, to use uh, uh, ash plantations that were infested by MR ash dieback for many years before, so we screened for resistance, and now they were infested by emerald ash borer. And then we collected the plant material like buds and leaves from the uh, from these uh, trees, both that are dead, that uh, by, were attacked by emerald ash borer and uh, survived, and from the trees that were missed by emerald ash borer for some reason. And then we also, as we for us pathologists, we are interested in microorganisms associated with emerald ash borer. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, overview. And I will I will now open the floor for questions as as before. Uh, please, you can you can raise your hand or pose uh, your question in the in the chat. I think you can uh, stop sharing the screen. Uh, well, unless there will be some specific question related to uh, to some of the information that you provided. Uh, you mentioned that in both direction in in the in in the north direction and the southern directions, uh, you can see, you could see that there is a, um, a very strong potential for further expansion. Uh, I was wondering if there is any uh, climatic or temperature gradients that can make it less less possible, or only the temperature there. Um, yeah, maybe the uh, the number of um, year that will take for an adult to to come out is is slowing down. Uh -huh. The, the impression, because we have some data set, we have one paper from St. Petersburg and then from Ukraine. And then in these papers, there are also some population studies have been done about development. So it's obvious that in the north, it's much, and you see the gap between the Tver and the St. Petersburg. So it was no natural spread detected in that part. And then we also see that it's not very, doesn't feel very well in, in St. Petersburg. So the climatic factor, looks like it is important, but nevertheless, in St. Petersburg, after the first year, they removed every and destroyed every ash tree attacked by emerald ash borer, as they could see, but still it came back the next year. So basically, it's very persistent even there. Uh, and in Ukraine, uh, I'm not entomologist actually, so the, the life moved me to, to this area. So in, in Ukraine, it looks like it's really, really good climatic conditions. And so then there is another question concerning how is the uh, the effect on um, on parasites. Uh, so if they uh, imagine some um, some other insect, some vesp or something like this that can somehow be controlling. I, um, uh, well, there is a mess. Uh, this message come from uh, Sabine Brown. Maybe you can, if you want, Sabine, you can unmute yourself and elaborate more. But my understanding, if there is any possible uh, integrated pest management that we can uh, we can foresee in as as to have some uh, natural antagonist. Yeah. So this is uh, this uh, this question has a long history. I mean, in the United States, uh, they found the spatium species and some other species of uh, uh, parasitic wasp that attack larvae. But this is they, they work with the Chinese uh, uh, species and then they had a lot of problems to introduce them into the United States, but they, it was the so catastrophe. So it took some years and then now they produce them like uh, on the industrial basis and they claim that there is some effects, negative effects on the emerald ash borer there. In Europe, we have one potential candidate. This is a European species from the same genus as a Spatium polonicum. And we have envisioned to initiate uh, tests with that. 
uh, under control conditions, uh, of course, the funded provider. So we have some vision here. Thank you very much. Then there are other questions. Uh, well, uh, I see that um, uh, Sabine is online. I don't know if you want to add something. Please, Sabine. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I don't, uh, maybe. Uh, it's very hard to hear you. Sorry, it's impossible. Uh, is it, uh, maybe I suggest we can uh, we can organize and uh, well, maybe you can ask uh, some more questions in the chat or we can follow up later on. And then now uh, I will need to uh, to to give um, the floor. I don't know if. Um, no, there was someone that was asking uh, the floor, but I don't see any more. But uh, there are a few questions here in, in the chat while Sabine trying to solve her, her connection issue is concerning other fractional species where um, it has been observed. And if you have if you have any data on uh, it to be favoring, if the insect is favoring one or the other three species, and if you have an indication of uh, other European countries where this is um, this is already this has already arrived. Uh, well, it's it's really in 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 Europe and Russia and Ukraine. Um, it's it's inherited from Soviet Union times. Fraxinus uh, pennsylvanica was very popular, and especially it was popular uh, along the roads and uh, field protection belts. And it's really much more susceptible to emerald dust borer. I mentioned a little bit that. Fraxinus excelsior looks like it's it's killed all the way, but uh, more or less, well, it looks a little bit less uh, vulnerable. And I don't know about any other ash species in Europe uh, and emerald ash borer. So I think somewhere there is a publication saying that it takes uh, in the in, in dendro parks it takes uh, all. I mean. And regarding the other European countries, uh, I don't know any other European countries. Maybe there's possibility that it is in Belarus, but uh, uh, Belarus is closed for now. But this, I have some team in Belarus as well. And I know that uh, before the, the, the war, they were monitoring the border and they didn't find at that time. It was like two years ago. And about the risk, future risk, it was, I mentioned already, it's in the north is Finland, Estonia by one way. And the, all the border with Ukraine, all the western border with Ukraine is really, all countries bordering are really threatened by the invasion. Thank you very much. Uh, we are about to close, but uh, I just want to check back with Sabine in case uh, she has a better audio connection now, if you want to try to ask again. I try now. I uh, it's perfect now, thank you. <laughs> okay. I have heard about uh, them, that in Moscow there were some parasitic wasps which can control the, the ash borer. Is this uh, uh, still a, a topic or is it uh, not efficient enough? Well, that's uh, yes, it is parasitic wasp. It's called Spartium polonicum. And we have envisioned to initiate that. There's no studies has been done. Uh, we will try. Uh, we will we tried already and failed and we will try again to apply uh, for this kind of study. It's it may be really valuable, especially because the in America they use Chinese wasps and they had a lot of trouble to introduce them on the last scale for the environmental reasons. And Spatium polonicum is the native European species. And, and then they found uh, a lot on the dead larvae. They found attacks of Spatium polonicum in the nature. So that's really promising, but we need uh, to have some funds for that. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to both our speakers today and for everyone being online. So I remind you that in this series of webinars, we'll have two more uh, occasions in, in, two, in, the, in the two following Fridays. And as mentioned at the beginning, um, all the, um, the recording of this presentation will be made available on, through the EFOGEN website. Um, again, um, uh, Michel and Vindis, uh, again, thank you very much for your time and um, um, goodbye to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye.